today I receive all of God's love for me. Today I open myself to the unbounded, limitless, overflowing abundance of God's universe. Today I open myself to God's blessings, healing, and miracles. Today I open myself to God's word. So I become more like Jesus every day. Today I proclaim that I'm God's beloved. I'm God's servant. I'm God's powerful champion. And because I am blessed, I am blessing the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Grace is gained righteousness at Christ's expense. The grace of God is not generic. There is a dimension of grace. Grace is God choosing to bless us rather than curse us as our sin deserves. From Latin, price paid. Mercy is loving the unlovable and forgiving the unforgivable. So the grace of God gives you the ability to accept, to act, to appreciate, and to adore Christ. Realizing that forgiveness is setting a prisoner free and discovering that that prisoner is me. Hey there, Feast fam. Thank you for coming online to be part of our Feast at Home. Today, I'm going to preach around the idea, we go up to go down. We go up to go down. Okay? And you might be thinking, Mike, okay ka lang. Um, baka nga kulang ka sa tulog dahil uh, sa baby niyong si Kyler, di ba? Uh, because what you're saying is gibberish. doesn't make any sense. It doesn't seem like it's making any sense at all. And if that's what you're thinking, yes, I agree. I mean, initially, when you hear this statement, we go up to go down, when you read it, it doesn't make any sense. Yet this seemingly nonsensical message was one of the core messages of Jesus and His ministry. And in case you haven't gotten used to it yet, most of Jesus' teachings initially didn't make any sense, right? So hang in there with me, because as we go along, eventually I believe it will all make sense, all right? It will make sense to you, it'll make sense to me, it'll make sense to our lives. So, let me begin by making sense of this through this story, right? And I think it's actually a movie, it's actually a movie um, entitled A Family Man, um, starring that guy from 300, his name is Gerard Butler. Maybe you've seen him, you've heard of him before. Um, and I think it's still on Netflix, so if you want, if in your own time, you can watch it. And don't worry, I won't spoil too much of the plot, I hope. <laughs> anyway, so here goes, here goes. Um, Dane Jensen, played by Gerard Butler, is a successful corporate headhunter whose life revolves around closing deals and climbing the corporate ladder. Um, and he does this in expense of his marriage and family life. So they're somehow getting the shorter end of the stick um, with um, Dane and because of his insatiable desire to succeed he sadly engages in shady practices um, and it somehow compromises or he often compromises his, his integrity um, he also becomes somehow distant um, with his wife and son because he didn't have really that much time for them because he was so just focused and consumed with his career now, one morning, um, Dane and his son, Ryan, went jogging and they did this to bond and to also exercise because um, they noticed that Ryan was somehow needed exercise and as they were jogging, um, he noticed as well that Ryan was quickly tired and had some bruises. So, just to be sure, they brought Ryan to the doctor to have him checked and right there and then, we get the shock of our life, their lives, Ryan, their son, their 
their only son was diagnosed, I think that only son, I think, yeah, their son. He was diagnosed with cancer. And again, Dane and his wife, Elise, was, was so shocked by this. And because of this development, because of what they have discovered through this medical checkup, this now forced Dane to reevaluate his life, to reevaluate his priorities and purpose. And he's now caught in a tough dilemma. I mean, should he continue going up the corporate ladder or sh should he grow up in being a father? Let me ask you, um, do you want to be successful? Do you want to get ahead in life? Do you want to go up in this world? I think if we're all honest, we all do, right? But if you ask me, I think if you ask me, is it okay, Mike, to, to have such dreams and desires? I mean, to get ahead, to go up in this world, to be successful? I would say, I think it's fine. But it all depends on how you define success. All right? On, on how you define getting ahead, what that means for you, and how you envision yourself going up in this world. Because here's the, here's the prevalent worldview. Success, getting ahead, and going up in society means more wealth, more privileges, more possessions, more views, more followers. I mean, you, you get the picture. But to Jesus' kingdom worldview, success, getting ahead, and going up means suffering, sacrifice, and service. See, the world's idea of a full life is often self-serving but Jesus's idea of a full life is all about self-giving and that's what our one big message today means we go up to go down in other words we can only truly begin to fully live or we can only truly begin to live full and significant lives when we choose to go down and dirty and sacrifice suffering and service. I'll say it again. Um, we only truly begin to live full and significant lives, lives of meaning, lives of purpose, lives of significance, when we choose to go down and dirty. And that usually means in sacrifice, suffering, and service. To paraphrase a, a song, and in fact, a song that comes from scripture, to paraphrase it, the um, song says, we find our life when we lay it down. I mean, we will only find lasting joy, fulfillment, and peace when we surrender our lives to God for the sake of others. And that's what Jesus was trying to get across into the heads and hearts of his apostles. But they couldn't seem to get it. In fact, in our key passage today, Jesus predicts His coming death again, all right? And I think this is probably the third time that He's doing this. And every time He talks about His death, the apostles don't get Him. I mean, they hear His words, but they don't hear His heartbeat. And the first time Jesus predicts His death, if you remember, Peter says, it ain't gonna happen over my dead body. Something like that, or something to that effect, right? The second time the apostles um, heard about Jesus, or the second time that Jesus told the apostles about his death, the apostles did something even worse. Because after hearing about their master's impending death, they argue who was the best, who was the greatest among them. I mean, they, they wanted validation and recognition. Kind of reminds me of this story, actually. Um, Richard Rich was a young... Cambridge graduate. He was a young guy, 23 years old, and he was looking for a job at the court of Henry VIII. Now, Thomas More, who was the Lord Chancellor of England, an influential man, says, says to Rich or Richard, I've got a job for you. I've got a job for you. There's an opening in the local school. And Richard, somehow disappointed, says, A teacher? Right? Are you sure? A teacher? And Thomas More says, well, you might be a great teacher. And to that, Richard then fires back and says, 
And if I were, who would know it? Right? If I were to be a great teacher, who would know it? And so here, you see, you see a man who, who, who doesn't want to accomplish great things. He just wants to be noticed for it. Again, the, the apostles didn't fully understand Jesus because they were caught up. They were caught up. They were so consumed in, with their own desire for greatness. And that's why, that's probably why Jesus found the need to explain his death over and over and over again. I thought what's frustrating is that, like many of us, they do the very opposite thing of what Jesus was teaching, right? And, and we, we will see this actually again in our key passage today. Now, um, I know this message is somehow shaping up to be something that may be hard to, to swallow for a lot of us, but do not be dismayed because I believe by the Spirit of God, as you open your heart and lean in and listen to the preaching of this word, you will not just hear his words, you will hear his heartbeat and your heart will begin to beat like his in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Um, in case you haven't noticed yet, uh, we are continuing our deep dive through the Gospel of Matthew. So as per usual, grab your Bibles, take it, with, take it. Um, uh, whether it's physical or digital, grab it and turn to Matthew chapter 20, verses 17 to 18. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 20. So we were there last week already. Uh, we went up to verse 16. Now we're starting at verse 17 down to 28. So here we go. Um, as I said earlier, for the third time, Jesus predicts his death. And what do the disciples do? They jostle for political power. And it's silly, actually. Imagine hearing of someone close to you um, telling about their death, and they, for at least in the second time, uh, argue who's the best among them. And then now they're they're trying to vie for position, for power. So let's begin reading. I think starting again from verse seventeen. Here we go. As Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples aside privately and told them what was going to happen to him. Verse 18. Listen, he said, we're going up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. They will sentence him to die. Then they will hand him over to the Romans to be mocked, flogged with a whip and crucified. But on the third day, he will be raised from the dead. So, as usual, his disciples didn't get it, didn't understand. And actually, we'll go back to that in a bit. But this is how they respond in, in verse 20. Then the mother of James, the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Zebedee, came to Jesus with her sons. She knelt respectfully to ask a favor. What is your request? Jesus asked. She replied, in your kingdom, please let my two sons sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right and the other on your left. Now, if you imagine this, you're probably picturing Mama Zebedee as one overzealous stage mom. And that's probably how I'd imagine it as well. I mean, the type who dresses her grown children in matching attires and drags her boys to give a song and dance number in birthday parties. I mean, that kind of type of, of mother, a stage mom. But actually, um, we ought to rethink that. We ought to think again. Because in Mark's version of this same story, there was no mom. Mom Zebedee was not there. Right? Um, it was James and John who actually asked Jesus for the positions of authority. And so this, this family, or uh, this was a family um, trying to grab power. It was a family plot to grab power. And they wanted to go up to stay up. But again, let me reiterate, um, let me reiterate our one big message so that it somehow sticks. We are called to go up to go down. And we go up for a purpose. 
So Jesus said, let's go back to verse 18. It says, he says there, we, listen, he said, we're going up. We, we were, or we are, or we're going up to Jerusalem, right? He, he said that. And Jerusalem was the capital of ancient Israel. I mean, that's where the big shots were. If you, if you wanted a seat among the powerful, that was the place to be. That was the place to go. You can probably liken it to modern times as New York City or, or L.A. And I guess, who doesn't want to go up, right? Um, we hear this all the time in our culture, in our society. I mean, aim for number one. <laughs> um, go up to the top. Uh, climb the corporate ladder, as I said earlier. And it's actually interesting that this was the same ambition of St. Augustine before he became a saint. So just somehow comforts us that we all struggle with this. I'll tell you the story. One day, St. Augustine, who was on the streets of Milan, he was on his way to talk to the, uh, sorry, he was on his way to a talk of the Roman emperor um, that he wrote himself. So the Roman emperor will give a speech, will give a message that Augustine wrote, okay? That Augustine composed. And he was inordinately proud of this accomplishment. So I'll just give you a backstory to this. Um, see, Augustine was from a little town in North Africa called Tagaste. And no one in Rome or Milan or Athens would have heard of that small town. But he was a gifted kid. So he was sent to Carthage, the most important city in his region. And during his time there, he received a basic education in grammar, writing, and rhetoric. And somehow this became, these three became his chosen field. He became an expert in words and speech making. And what Augustine wanted above all was to make it to the imperial court. I mean, if you were a rhetorician, or if you uh, wrote speeches and gave speeches at that time, that was the highest ambition you could have, to be the writer for the emperor himself. So fired by this ambition, Augustine landed a job as a professor um, first in Rome. Then in time, he got invited to Milan, where the Roman emperor was living. And there he was granted the privilege of writing in behalf of the emperor, or writing for the emperor. And all of his dreams now were suddenly coming true. I mean, everything that he dreamt of as a young boy was now right before him. And that was what he was feeling. That's what he was thinking about as he made his way to this speech by the emperor that he had written. So on his way, on his way to the venue where the speech will be given, on his way to, to the speech, he spots a pathetic man so drunk that he could barely stand. And he was muttering to himself, stalking to himself. And he, he was just wandering around. And, and Augustine sees this man. And at that moment, Augustine began to compare himself to that man. So here was Augustine, now at the height of his career, an accomplished, well-admired writer for the emperor. And this pathetic man drunk, wandering around, muttering around the street. Suddenly an insight from the Lord hit, hit Augustine, spoke into his heart and said, you yourself are no different from this man. This man is addicted to alcohol, so addicted in fact that his drinking made him less than human. But aren't you yourself, Augustine, in the grip of addiction? Aren't you addicted to ambition? I mean, you first tasted that drug when you were a young man, and you've been chasing it all your life. In the course of your life, you've been pursuing this great ambition, and you've turned your life over to getting ahead. So you are as much a slave to ambition as this man is a slave of his addiction to alcohol. I mean, you, on your way to hear a speech by the emperor composed by yourself, is just as pathetic as this man. And another insight actually came to him. And this time, he said to himself, 
if anything, I am worse off than this drunk man. Because by morning, he will sober up. While as I, who've been drunk with ambition for years, is showing no signs of sobering up. You know, when I read that line, personally, it hit me. As I too had been fueled by so much ambitions, ambitions in ministry for probably, or honestly, the wrong, selfish, prideful reasons. And just as those insights from the Lord changed Augustine and changed his life, it changed me as well. I mean, those insights convinced me that I was just like James and John, asking for high and mighty positions in the world when in fact we are called to bend down, even drop down and serve the fallen and the faceless in society. And that, my friends, is the craziness of the kingdom. Jesus, our King, Jesus, was going up, was going up to Jerusalem. Jesus was going up so he could go down. He was going up to Jerusalem to die powerless, to die powerless, to serve the powerless. And that's why Jesus was given divine glory, right? You see, divine glory is different from human worldly glory. Divine glory is the splendor of self-sacrificing love. And that's what Jesus did on the cross. Amen? Amen. Now notice, Jesus said to his disciples, we're going up, not I'm going up. Again, he said, we're, we are going up. Not I'm just going up, right? Not, not, not just himself. It was like Jesus was saying, guys, I'm going to suffer to rescue the suffering. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die to give life to the dying. That's my plan. May we do this together. I mean, will you also go up to go down? And by this time, you probably already sense that Jesus' version of going up, going up, is very different from ours and the world's. In fact, it actually means two not very appealing actions. So number one, number one is this. Going up means to suffer. So listen how Jesus replied to Mama Zebedee and the Zebedee boys. Sound, they sound like a boy band now, all right? In, in verse 22. But Jesus answered by saying to them, you don't know what you are asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I'm about to drink? Jesus asked. And, and reading this, reading this, I, I'm, I'm just thinking, cup of suffering? I mean, for real? Are you, are you for certain? Are, are you sure cup, for suf cup of suffering? I mean, I'd rather have a cup of coffee by Bene Sanchez or, 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 or milk tea. I mean, that's what I'll have. Please, please, cu cup of coffee or milk tea. But suffering? Cup of suffering? No way. In fact, we live in a culture that hates inconvenience at the very least. Right? We don't, we don't like inconvenience. We don't like it when our Grab driver is late or our Food Panda driver is late for that matter. I mean, we get angry when our Wi-Fi is slow and we frown, we frown. And we get triggered when our PMs or emails are not replied within a few hours. So why in the world, right? Why in the world will we, will we put suffering in a cup and drink it? But, but that's the call of Jesus. That's the question. He's asking each and every one of us today, are you willing to go up and suffer for others? Just like these two guys, right? Just like these two guys in, in, that I'll somehow narrate to you in a bit. In fact, one of them wasn't even Christian. Mohandas Gandhi um, was a young lawyer in South Africa and he led a small protest against unjust British law. Suddenly, the police, police came um, and he was told to stop. He, he kept speaking and, and he, he, he refused to stop. So he then gets beaten over um, many times, over and over again, due to his refusal to stop. And finally, he got knocked unconscious to the ground. And his suffering, if you think about it, was completely unjustified. I mean, he didn't merit it or deserve it in any way. And yet his suffering and sacrifice was the spark that lit the fire of a revolution in South Africa. And later, 
right, also set the tone for an even greater revolution in India that eventually led to their freedom. The other guy is Martin Luther King. You've probably heard of him. He led, he, had, he led protests in the in deep in the deep American South during the 1950s. He and another African man sat down at a whites-only lunch counter to simply demonstrate the injustice of racial segregation. And Martin, because of this, was arrested and thrown into prison. But many others, because of his example, right, um, were inspired. They were inspired by his example and also protested to this injustice. And they were shot with water cannons, threatened by snarling dogs, and in extreme cases, even shot to death. And again, none of, none of that suffering was merited. None of it was deserved. None of it was just. But it was accepted knowingly and willingly. And this good, this suffering, this good led to the good of others. So because of the sacrificial service of these courageous people, the, the civil rights reforms became a reality in the U.S. So today, my friends, again, Jesus is asking you, are you willing to go up and suffer for others? Because as Bishop Robert Barron says, unjust suffering, patiently and lovingly endured, unleashes redemptive power to the world. Say that again. Unjust suffering, patiently and lovingly born, patiently and lovingly endured, unleashes redemptive power to the world. Friends, kingdom significance comes from a position of sacrifice and suffering for the sake of others. Now, let's listen to how these Z boys, the ZBD boys, <laughs> um, answer Jesus in verse 22. So again, uh, Jesus asked, are you going to drink this cup of suffering that I'm going to drink? And, and this is how they answered. Yes, they replied, we are able. All right? We are able. And in verse 23, Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup. But I have no right to say who will sit on my right or my left. My Father has prepared those places for the ones He has chosen. And, and do you know, do you know who, who God assigned those special places to? In fact, get ready. Get ready to know and be shocked and be stunned. Because it's, it's very surprising. A few chapters later, Matthew all right, tells us, who he was pertaining to and, and, and who Jesus was pertaining to. And in verse or chapter 27, verse 28, we know um, who was in, in his left and right. All right. We find it there. It says there, then they crucified two bandits with Jesus, two outlaws, two criminals, all right? One on his right and the other on his left. See, James and John made two mistakes. First, they thought that those who will stand beside Jesus would be the great and mighty, and in religious Israel, even the holy as well. But God chose condemned criminals, the most despised people on the earth, I mean, um, to be with Him. Even to the very end, Jesus hung out, literally hung out, okay? with his favorite people, the scum of the earth, the sinner, the suffering, the socially outcast, the spiritually bankrupt. I mean, these were the top 10 besties of Jesus. And if you've tracked along in scripture um, long enough in this series, his besties are, are, are very different, right? And this, this should lead us, this should lead us also to look into our own list of friends. I mean, try scrolling through Facebook or your Facebook friends list and see um, like Jesus, do, do we have friends among the lost, the least and the last? Because having such friends and helping them, lifting them up, makes us more like Jesus. Amen? Second mistake of, of James and John was that they imagined themselves sitting on two comfy thrones, probably like a lazy boy, <laughs> I don't know, um, two comfy thrones beside the kingly throne of Jesus. But Jesus' throne is very different. They didn't know that Jesus' throne 
was a cross. That his crucifixion was his coronation. And so the thrones beside his cross, beside his throne, were also crosses, right? So what does this tell us? And this may sound radical, but this tells you and me that the goal of every Jesus follower is to be crucified. It's just a question of how. It's just a question of how. And for James and John, eventually, they did suffer. They did drink that bitter cup of suffering, as Jesus said. And what happened to James and John are actually two ways of being crucified, the two kinds of crucifixion. In, in this passage, um, if you somehow uh, get, get the idea, James and John were, were, were still young then. Um, they were maybe immature in their faith. James and John were, were blinded by selfish ambition. But, but through the years, they matured spiritually and they finally got it. They finally got what Jesus was teaching and talking about. And, and in fact, in, in Acts 12, James became the first apostle to become a martyr. Um, and that's the first way to be crucified. He became a martyr and that's the first way to be crucified. John shows us the second way. Historians say that he lived a long life serving as the bishop in Ephesus. Uh, he was, I think, perhaps the only apostle that didn't die a martyr, but he was still crucified in a sense, in a sense that he died to himself. He died to his self-serving dreams and desires and committed his life to selfless service to God's people. See, most of us, won't die as martyrs. I mean, we won't die as martyrs, many of us probably. Instead, like done, we die each day to our own selfish ambitions. And out of that death, we live, we begin to live, not for ourselves, but for others. In fact, I believe crucified in this day and age, that term crucified means to suffer for another to suffer for another and this leads us to the second meaning of going up and to preach the rest of this message let's listen to brother Bo Sanchez this is no accident God wants you to be here the reason why you are listening to me now is because God planned intended and invited you to be here and you said yes so congratulations this is Bo Sanchez welcoming you again to the feast I need to dive in to the message because this message is so powerful as you've heard the power of God in his word is amazing so lesson number two going up means to serve. This is the definition of Jesus. The disciples could not understand this. Verse 24, let's read. When the 10 other disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. And you know what? They were not angry because the Z brothers had no delicadeza. You know, I mean, whoa, humingi ng cabinet positions. Grabe naman yan. Napaka, napaka, oh, forward. You know what? They were not angry because of that. My guess, naunahan lang sila. <laughs> That's why they were angry. They wanted the power. They also wanted those seats anyway. Because they did not understand, Jesus had to really, in Tagalog, hinimay-himay niya. He really had to dissect everything and bring it in front of them as clearly and as plainly as possible. Let's read what he said in verse 25. But Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of this world lord it over their people and the officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become a slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. If you ask people today, what do you want to do with your life? You'll get various answers depending on all sorts of factors. Um, people my age, okay, a little bit older, you ask them, 
what do you want to do with your life? And they will tell you, oh, I want to have lots of money in the bank. I want to have a big house. I want to drive a big car. I want to have, you know, yeah, you know, retire at the age of 65 and play golf the entire day. Woohoo! That's the classic answer. But if you go down to uh, younger people, millennials, Gen Zs, their answer will be very different. They will say, to retire at the age of 35, to be able to work from a beach, to have an online business that runs on autopilot, to, uh, autopilot, to have a significant uh, other that I will enjoy life with, and, and to be able to do what I want to do, when I want to do, where I want to do. So, so that's the answer for, for younger people. But don't you notice whether it's the classic answer from people my age or the the more updated answer from younger people it's still about me and the reason why i want to pause i think that's why a lot of people are not happy because when god created us and when god designed us we're designed for bigger things than me. And I bet if a Jesus follower were to be asked, what, what do you want to do with your life? She'll say, I want to be crucified with Jesus and through my life be a blessing to others. You know, Jesus said in another, in another part of, of, the, of the scriptures, anyone who loves their life will lose it. If it's all about me, 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 you will never have the fulfillment and the joy that God wants you to have. I'll repeat, in John 12, verse 25, anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And of course, the, the word hate is not literal, all right? Um, can, can I share a personal story? Because I am young at heart, Nax, <laughs> my answer to the question, uh, you know, what do you want to do with your life? You know what? It's more similar to the updated answer. I'll tell you why. I've been married for 23 years and we still live in a small house to this day um, because my work is more about traveling. And yes, there, there were times that I was working from a beach. That's right. And, and uh, um, I, I do have an online business uh, to support my own family and to support uh, God's work. But do I live the life of freedom? You know, uh, to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, where I want to do it. And the answer is no. <laughs> I've been serving God as a missionary for 40 plus years. And this is what I tell my wife, that if I wanted to live a quiet life, all, all I have to do is just do one thing. Stop serving. <laughs> you know what? When I do that, I'm going to eliminate 75% of my problems. No joke. Because most of my suffering comes from my serving. And here's why. When the people I care for have problems, they become my problems. And that's why my problems multiply. Um, something happened to me a few months ago. Uh, some of you know that I had COVID. And so when I had COVID, I, I had a new perspective in life. I kind of like pined for, longed for um, a more... A more simpler life of, you know, settling in a farm. I kind of like saw myself, you know, waking up in the morning surrounded by the wind and the trees and looking at the grass and, and this, this open, open field in front of me. So, oh, that'll be nice. So, you know, I'm already 55 and it would be nice to move into a farm and do my writing there, etc. Surrounded by nature. So, so I could pray and write the whole day. Um, that would be my picture of bliss. <laughs> Here's what happened. Something unexpected. So when I started planning for it, um, <laughs> it, I started thinking about a million other things connected to my move to a farm. For example, um, 
I'm going to have a farm, so I'm going to hire people to take care of the farm since I'm not a farmer, right? So when I started thinking, okay, who are the people I'm going to hire? I started caring. I started thinking of how to care for these people. Like I, I'm going to pay, pay them higher wages. I'm going to teach them how to invest so that they will retire as, as millionaires uh, because that's what I do with all my employees. And um, I began to think, okay, and what if there are poor people around the farm? Um, I'm, I'm going to have to find a way to help them also. And so <laughs> that's when I started laughing and laughing because I said, it's not going to be a very quiet life after all. And then God whispered these words to me. And I want to share that with you right now. Um, that the purpose, God told me, the purpose of your existence is not to have a peaceful life but to be crucified each day for others. But when you suffer for others, that is when you receive the greatest peace. And by the way, I know me, I know my weaknesses on a human level. Dying to myself is impossible, totally impossible. I'm just too selfish to do it. I know me, believe you me. But by his supernatural grace, with Jesus giving himself on the cross, the grace that you receive, I'll be able to go up, to go down. Meaning to say, the only way I can die to myself is if Jesus is right here beside me, <laughs> empowering me and giving me that help and the grace. And so that's why we come into worship now. You come into worship because you know this is where God wants you to, to, to go. This is what he wants you to do. But it's got to be with Jesus. And so worship him now. Open up your life to him and open up your heart to the supernatural grace and the abundant mercy that can only come from Jesus. It is so beautiful to be in the presence of God. And can we pray right now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I want you just to lift up to him all your needs. Whatever you're going through, he knows what you're going through. He knows where you're coming from. He knows the burdens of your heart. Just, just bring it up to God and say, Lord, I surrender everything that all hurt and all pain and all worries and all fear. Lift them all up to you, Lord. I surrender them to you. You are my king and you are the center of my life. And I trust you and I know that you are blessing me right now. I receive your love. I receive your joy. I receive your peace. I receive your healing. I receive your provision in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you so much for joining me today. Live a fantastic life.